I have a question for all of you. Just close your eyes and for a moment, best imagine, would you exchange your space for Damocles? Uh, you would have heard about the story of Damocles. Damocles was the guy, just close your eyes, think about it, whether you like exchange your space with Damocles. You're sitting on this big throne, there is this banquet table in front of you, it has everything on that plate. You have all your fantasies, you have all your fancies, everything you loved, you wanted to have ever in your life is right in front of you. There is only one small discomfort. There is this big, heavy, shining, sharp sword which is hanging on top of your head, which is hanging by a thin air. And at any point of time, this thin hair is getting stretched. And at some point of time, one thing is certain, that that hair would break, the sword would come swooshing down, and there would be blood on the floor. Would you like to switch places with Damocles? Would you? I don't know, there could be some of you who might still want to, who are living in a hostel, but let's see. Yeah? Yeah. So I have a good news and a bad news for you. The good news first, you don't need to exchange your space with Damocles. The bad news next, because you are sitting on the space of Damocles. There is a sword which is hanging on top of your head. The hair is getting stretched. It's only a matter of time when that sword would come down and you would see the blood splattered on the floor. Every guy in this auditorium, every guy who's guy or girl who's in the auditorium and outside the auditorium is today sitting at the same place where that Greek guy or dude called Democles was sitting at some point of time. We've, we've come such a long way. We have this insatiable desire for energy that we have plundered our earth, we have destroyed our ecosystem, we've reached a stage where we have ourselves started the doomsday clock. And this doomsday clock has already started ticking. We need to find solutions for it. We are running against time. Uh, and we need to find a way by which we can get energy immortality. Uh, we are, I would, lots of biologists are still trying to work out mankind immortality. I think mankind immortality would also come one at one point of time, but that's for another subject. But clearly, energy immortality would come far before mankind immortality comes. So today what I'll do is, I'll take you through this fascinating journey of what is happening, all the events which are happening around you, which are shaping this world. Yep, eight minutes, eight minutes it takes for the rays of the sun to start off from the surface of the sun and to reach the earth. And the earth has always been thirsty, always been hungry for these rays of sun, for our food as well as health. I'll come to health later on and food later on. But today, sun also feeds all our energy needs. Sun increasingly is feeding energy needs across the world. Yeah. In less than two hours, the amount of energy which Earth receives is equivalent to the energy requirement of the whole of the world for the full one year. Just imagine, the, the scale is too high. Uh, typically, a year has 8760 hours. It's a simple calculation of 24 into 365. So it, a year has 8760 hours, and I'm only talking about two hours from those 8760 hours, yes? Within those two hours, we would get the sort of energy that we require to energize all the factories in this world, all the houses in this world, to work your smartphones, your music system, your cars, your mobile phones, your telecommunication equipment, everything. Let's assume that we, we've got a magic wand by which we can do that. Even if we can't do it in two, two hours, if we are able to do it in four hours, if you are able to do it in six, 10, 50, 100, the, the ratios are so big that clearly 
the consequences are something that we just can't imagine. We've just scraped the surface of uh, this brilliant phenomenon. We, it, the sun is pretty far off, so at times it looks very tiny, but actually it is very big. Uh, the diameter of the sun is practically 100 times the diameter of the earth. You can imagine the scale that I'm talking about. Uh, if you see the sun, and if I were to consider the sun as a hollow sphere, there would be one million earth which can be dropped into that hollow sphere. One million earth, we can calculate. One million is 10 lakhs. So 10 lakh earths we can drop into a big sphere of sun. So the consequences are immense. We just need to figure out how to, how to, how to exploit the potential. We've still, not, we've still not scratched the surface, as I said. Yeah. Have you ever tried to take out the ketchup from the bottle? At first, the ketchup refuses to come out. You tap a little, maybe some drops of the ketchup would come out. You give the same amount of intensity, the same amount of tap to the neck of the bottle, and some globules would come out. Maybe after six or seven or eight taps, the whole of the ketchup comes out. This is something which, in, if you would read the Malcolm Gladwell's uh, book, it is called the tipping point. The tipping point means that while you are doing the same amount of effort, suddenly the consequences are non-linear. The consequences are not proportional to the amount of effort that you're putting in. We are similarly doing the same thing in solar. In solar, you keep on putting the same effort and there would come a time when the ketchup would start flowing out of the bottle. We've still not reached the place when the ketchup would start coming out of the bottle. This is disruptive. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are very comfortable when we talk of linear progressions. We're very comfortable when we talk of arithmetic progressions. The trouble starts off when we talk of geometric progressions. When we talk of 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128. That's the trouble that happens. Our mind is not tuned to thinking, visualizing what happens when geometric progressions takes place. And we are, as we talk, we are sitting in a space, we are sitting in a world where geometric progressions are taking off. So we just can't visualize, we just can't visualize what the world would be in the next two years, in the next four years, because the geometric progression would take it to those boundaries which are beyond our imagination. We would have never expected it. So we have a lot of technology which is happening around us, which we clearly call it disruptive. And not only, I would not call it disruptive, I would also call it a game changer. Because whatever assumptions that we've taken so far in life, one by one, those assumptions would get broken as we move forward. I, I started off my talk saying that with respect to health and food, we always owe it to the sun. We actually never knew how to convert one type of energy into another type of energy. Just see around 200 years back or 400 years back or even now what's happening is that you typically have a human body like mine. There's a juicer inside my body. We call it metabolism. And through the metabolism, we take in organic compounds, which we call it food. Our body is the engine. The food gets converted into energy. And we use this energy for using our muscle. And then there is a movement of hand and feet which takes place. Where do, where do we get these organic compounds from? If you go through the food chain, at the end of the day, at the bottom of the food chain, you have plants. And what do plants do? Plants have chlorophyll. Plants take energy from the sun, and they convert through, again, a juicer called photosynthesis. And they convert the solar energy into organic compounds. So it was a complicated process sometime around 100 years back. So you had the plants which were taking in solar energy using photosynthesis, converting solar into organic compounds, and then the human beings used to eat them, and then we used to convert the same thing from carbohydrates to energy. So it was a long process. It was from solar on one hand to the energy on the other one. We just needed something that by which we can convert solar directly into energy. 
we have done this now. One thing which solar has done is that solar today has democratized energy. Earlier on, energy was only accessible, was only available to few who could afford it. It was very difficult to haul all that electricity to the remote parts of the world, to where no transmission lines can go. And actually, if you, if you see, sun is free to all. There is, there, is no, there is no permit which is required. There is no, you don't need to pay any toll tax or you don't need to pay any tax to any government to exercise your control over the sun. It is the most, it is, I would say it is the most democratic institution of all. You want to have sunlight, there is nothing, no government in this world can sort of uh, inhibit you from using the sunlight. So sun in some way has democratized the whole of energy. You would have seen nations have gone to war. Nations have gone to war or because somebody wanted to capture the oil fields which belong to another nation. We've seen nations quarreling over uh, water, water distribution that the people construct huge amount of dams so that they don't want to share water. But with respect to sun, it is free for all. So in a way, in a way, we are moving towards a space, we are moving towards time when clearly democratization of energy would happen and sun would be responsible for it. In a way, sun would be responsible for re removing violence from this earth because much of the violence has happened in the past so many years because of the need to have the sources of energy as energy security of number of nations. Once you eliminate it, then part of the problem gets resolved. We have, we have all, of these, all of these spectrum of possibilities. And as far as solar is concerned, it is at just one end of the spectrum of possibilities. On the other end of the spectrum of possibilities, you have, you have this coal, oil, and gas. All of this, the coal, oil, and the gas, we have only a limited quantity of that on Earth. We are, we are losing out on coal, oil, and gas. It is available in the finite quantity. At some point of time, we would run out of all of these three. And that time would come sooner than later. And typically what happens is, so whenever you want to base your future, you want to base your future on something which is optimistic, something which is certain. You can't base your future on something which is uncertain because only when the future is certain, if you see the history of mankind, only when the future is optimistic, only when we have belief in our future that the progress has happened. If you were to see around 400 years back, human mankind used to think that the pie is limited, the pie that we need to share. And you would see that the only thing people used to do was fight wars against each other because they knew that if I want to become bigger, I want to eat the other guy's pie. But with respect to energy, when it came in, the pie suddenly become bigger. And now the mankind was able to comprehend that the pie can also become bigger. And in order to me to prosper, it's not necessarily that I would eat the pie of others because the pie is getting bigger and I can make my pie bigger. So in a way, if you see all of these, all of this coal, oil and gas, they are not as bad as it looks on the face of it. In the last 200 years, huge amount of prosperity has happened. Huge amount of progress have happened. The progress that we've received in the last 200 years is far more than what mankind has done in the last 70,000 years. And when I talk of 70,000 years, if you see the history of mankind, it's, it was around 70,000 years back that the cognitive development of human being took place when we started thinking. Around 12,000 years back, we started agriculture. So the agriculture revolution came in. But the huge amount of prosperity and the growth and the advancement in uh, advancement in technology, in industrial growth, came in when all of these fossil fuel came in. The steam engine changed it all. The steam engine 
gave a complete different definition to the efficiency, which was hetero unknown to mankind. We could do the work which we used to do in months, we could convert it into days. So in a way, the steam engine completely changed the narrative. And we need to thank all the fossil fuel for changing that narrative. We have, we have done so much advancement in the past so many years only because fossil fuel was there. Yeah, but at the same time, once the fossil fuel came in, we all know what happens. We all know that whenever you burn fossil fuel, you have carbon dioxide which is coming out, you have sulfur dioxide which is coming out, you have nitrous oxides which are coming out. And I don't need to sort of talk about the whole effects of global warming, the polar ice cap melting, the rise in the sea levels, the low-lying areas getting drowned. It is a sort of an apocalypse scenario, that apocalypse is coming sooner than later. Fossil fuel is the new sugar. Yeah, uh, if you see, the sugar would not kill so many people. The sugar would kill huge amount of people and the same amount of people would be killed by the fossil fuel itself. It is addictive. We've become so much addictive to fossil fuel for the simple reason that we want huge amount of energy and we never need, seem to be satisfied from the quantity of energy that we require. It's like, it's like, it's like diabetes. You know it is bad for you, but still you can't move away from the sugar. The pills would not do any longer. We've reached the stage when we need to explore several other things before we find a solution for energy immortality. We owe it to our future generations. As I said, we cannot give something which is uncertain. We cannot give something which is of short supply to our future generations. Our future generations required something which is sustainable. They required something which, is, which would last them. It, they required something which would last generations after generations. We have, we have spectrum of possibilities. I think within, within the fossil fuel on one side and the solar on one side, solar can only give you energy as long as the sun is there. But what happens when the sun is not there? Wind can only give you energy when wind is there. What happens when wind is not there? So you would have, you would have alternative narratives. Sometimes when sun is there, you would have alternative narrative coming into play, and sometimes when the sun is not there. Yeah, so, so it's not that the sun is the ultimate solution. Sun also has an Achilles heel. As I said, if the sun is not shining, you would not get solar energy. If wind is not blowing, you would not get wind energy. Uh, hydropower is there. You can combine hydro with wind, with solar. If you, if, if you have studied hydropower, hydropower is something which is similar to storage. But why it happens that whenever there are conflicting narratives which are there, which are in either end of the spectrum, we get into polarization. We polarize ourselves. The guys, I've been on the other side of the table, the people who feel that fossil fuel are the only solution to this world, they would say, that all the renewable guys are romantic guys. They would never be able to satisfy the energy needs of the world. And they are just going around propagating their theory. Whereas the solar guys, the evangelistic zeal would always keep around and start saying that all these fossil fuel are just making the doomsday clock tick longer. Why can't we, why can't we sit? Why can't we figure out that it's not necessary that we need to bind ourselves, ground ourselves in the opposing narrative. There is always a chance of a compromise. There is always a chance of something which is in between. And this is something which is in between is that what we are talking about today. So you have coal on one end of the spectrum, you have oil on one end of the spectrum, and you have solar on the other end of the spectrum. Are these the two, only two alternatives? Of course not. You have to walk through the whole spectrum to figure out which is the possibility that suits me the best. As 
as the topic of today's discussion says, uh, gray matters. This gray is the bridge. Gray is the bridge, gray is the cooperation, and gray is handing, giving a hand of cooperation from the black to the white. Whenever there is a conflicting narrative which is there, this gray comes into play. We don't know the solutions. There are many solutions which are there in this gray zone. We would talk about biofuels, we would talk about hydropower, we would talk about tidal power, we would talk about fusion, fission, so there are lots of things which are there in this gray zone. I would like to bring a concept of fragility and anti-fragility. I think all of you who have not read uh, Nasib's book, he talks about fragility and, and anti-fragility. It typically talks about concept of rules, principles and values. And he talks about that rules are always very fragile. You can make 1001 rules, but they're always exposed to manipulation. And you can always break them. So as far as non-renewables are concerned, they are on one end of the spectrum. They are fragile. We can keep making rules that we will have better technology, we would reduce the consumption, we would have less pollution. But rules are rules, they can easily be broken. On the other end of the spectrum are virtues. It's something like honesty is a virtue. You can make rules that I would not steal, I would not, uh, I would not tell a lie, but those rules can always be broken. But with respect to virtues, once we say honesty is the best policy, that's a virtue which is embedded. Then you can't move around. That's anti-fragile. There is no other narrative than, than the virtue. So I would say that renewable is a virtue. A non-renewable is a fragile, and renewable is an anti-fragile. As I said, solar is a virtue. It used to, it used to happen quite a some time back that number of people used to consider solar as a, just a hobby. But in the last five, six years, solar from being a technology which was expensive suddenly has become very competitive. Uh, renewables were always expensive. Non-renewables were always cheap. They were always affordable. But you had an issue with them. The issue that you had with them was that they created pollution which destroyed our environment. Whereas when you talk about solar, Solar was renewable, solar de didn't destroy the environment, but the problem with solar was that it was very expensive. Over a period of time, the solar prices have come down from around four years back, it was around 18 rupees per kilowatt hour. Now it is near about four rupees. So this is what I call geometric progression. This is what I call disruption. This is what I call sort of moving towards the tipping point. You don't come around for something which cost, you've only seen prices going up. You've never seen prices coming down. But you have suddenly have a situation that four years back somebody would never have imagined that somebody, something which cost 18 rupees today would cost four rupees. Uh, please think about it, tell me even a single item that you use in your daily life where the price has come down from 18 to four. If the price comes down by half, then it comes from 18 to 9. When again it comes down by half, then it becomes 9 to 2 and a, 4 and a half. So we've traveled from 18 to 4 and a half or 4 and now less than 4 in just 4 years time. So that's the, that's the scale which I'm talking about. And I think we are moving towards, we are moving towards the path of energy uh, immortality. And whenever we go towards that path of energy immortality, there would always be shades of gray. And if you actually see uh, on a lighter note, what is the day today? Saturday. What's the day tomorrow? Can you just slowly spell Sunday? What does it mean? Have you ever, ever thought that Sunday is actually Sunday? What's the, what's the Hindi word for sun? Any, some other word? Ravi. And what is tomorrow? And what does Ravi war and Sunday connote to you? It's a day off. And what, what, what does Sunday mean to you? And what else? You feel happy, you feel relaxed. 
you feel that you all your worries have gone off. So Sunday and Ravivar, it's been it's been going on for centuries. You always knew that Sunday is a day when you can relax, when you can leave everything to the sun and you can relax and have all your worries away. So thanks a lot. Thank you.